I've been searching for the perfect desktop NAS device for what feels like forever. And I think I might have finally found it. Oh yeah, it's new server day. Today's video was sponsored by and published in cooperation with 45 Drives. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So it was almost exactly a year ago that 45 Drives invited myself and a bunch of other faces you might recognize out to their main campus in Sydney, Nova Scotia. Their Creator Summit was a meeting of the minds, so to speak, to talk about the needs of home labbers and small businesses. And it's where we got our first peek at the 45 Home Lab HL15. During the summit, each creator was asked to give a talk about their own home labs, life as a creator, and answer the question, why exactly do people build home labs? When my talk came around, I focused on entry-level servers like you saw at the beginning of this video. I went over pre-built NAS appliances, four and six bay storage devices, DIY chassis, and said that they all had one thing in common. They're all crap. And look, they all do storage and hold hard drives just fine. But if you wanted a server that does storage and has some home lab features, basically every unit for less than $1,000 only includes a quad-core Intel embedded Celeron. As of 2023, most of them weren't even upgraded to Alder Lake and 100s yet, so the performance was even worse than you think. While most brag about being all-in-one home server solutions, they're usually not even fast enough to get out of their own way for storage needs, let alone be able to run dockers or virtual machines, as there's just not enough threads or memory to go around. While we were all excited for the release of the HL15, 45 Home Labs 15 bay rack mount chassis, which I have a review of right up here, I pointed out that most home labbers aren't crazy enough to have server racks in their house. So why are they forcing themselves to design a rack mount product? During our tour of 45 drives, I uh, acquired one of their drive cages and backplane assemblies from the lab and held it up. I explained that they've already done the engineering required to wire in hard drives. Now they just need to build a really good box around it. It was a challenge to turn their way of thinking on its head, ignore the requirements of a rack mount chassis, and build a fantastic NAS that actually serves the needs of home labbers. Getting out of that enterprise mindset also means not everything needs to be Intel Xeon or AMD Epic powered. While home labbers all love running enterprise gear, it's almost always comprised of multi-generation old products that were purchased because they were a good deal on the used market, not because they were the best option to purchase new. So what does it look like when you design a NAS with home labbers in mind? You get the 45 Home Lab HL8. This is an eight bay server for anyone who doesn't have a server rack, but still follows the same tenets of other 45 Drives products. Big, strong, and fast. The chassis is built from the same two millimeter thick steel as their rack mount servers, meaning this thing is built like an absolute tank. The HL8 weighs a whopping 21 pounds with just the motherboard and power supply installed. And that's before you add any hard drives into it. If you're looking for the same kind of quality you get from rack mount equipment, that's exactly what you're gonna find here. Inside the HL8 chassis is a fairly familiar sight if you've ever looked inside a 45 drive storinator. We've got eight three and a half inch toolless and trayless drive bays for all of your mass storage needs, all pre-wired to a 12 gigabit SATA and SAS compatible backplane. The drive cages actually utilize 3D printing for the drive sliders along the sides. If you're interested in seeing what that looks like, check out this video of me and Joel Telling put together his HL15 complete with some custom blue drive slides. Though I will say, I still think they'd look better in green. Now, one thing I didn't see in here were any two and a half inch SSD bays, an omission that I just wasn't happy with. As I had a fair amount of input in the creation of the HL8, I asked if it would be possible to add a couple two and a half inch trays next to the hard drive cage. And I'm happy to say that 45 drives is doing exactly that. Similar to the HL15, you can 3D print your own SSD mounting bracket and install it into holes that will be drilled into the side of the drive cage in future models. Those files will be available from 45 Drive's page over on printables.com, and they'll also be selling two and a half inch trays as an add-on if you don't have a 3D printer. But hard drives are only part of that equation. What about the rest of the system? The HL8 is going to be available in three configurations. For the DIY crowd, you can purchase the chassis, drive cage, and backplane, and bring your own motherboard, storage controller, and power supply. Now, usually for the DIY crowd, I'd normally recommend simply buying your own power supply, but you can choose to have one pre-installed. The HL8 uses a Flex ATX power supply. In this case, it's a Silverstone 500 watt 80 plus gold. Flex ATX power supplies are much less common than standard ATX or even SFX power supplies, and tend to be quite a bit more expensive than standard ATX units. 
and for the expansion of the HL8, 500 watts should be more than plenty for basically everything you would ever want to throw at it. So honestly, getting one direct from 45 drives is not a terrible deal. If you want to build your own, what is the HL8 like to build in? Well, this is a neat party trick that I've been dying to show you. Rather than removing panels entirely from the HL8, it actually unfolds kind of like a flower, making everything accessible just by turning these couple of captive thumb screws. Ah? Ah? Right? Everything is laid out, easily accessible, easily installable. You've got access to your power supply. You've got access to the drives. You've got access to your cabling that goes to the back plane. You've got your ITX motherboard. You've got everything that you need laid out very, very easy. And then it all just kind of folds right back up together. It's a really slick design. Moving on to the main event, we've got the PC itself. Now again, this can be a completely DIY affair where you bring your own ITX motherboard and CPU. And trust me, I've got some really fun plans for the system in the next couple weeks, so make sure you stay tuned for that. But you can also buy a fully built unit that's ready to run out of the box if you'd rather go that route. Inside, we've got a Gigabyte B550i Aorus Pro AX motherboard, along with an AMD Ryzen 5500 GT. It's a 6-core, 12-threaded processor based on AMD's Zen 3 architecture. This full-on 65-watt desktop chip is designed to sip on power, but still delivers some very impressive performance, especially if you're used to running Broadwell-era Xeons in your server rack, or Intel Celerons and Atom processors in devices like this. It's got a base clock of 3.6 GHz with a turbo of 4.4. Now, while some people might balk at only six cores in a home server, keep in mind that when it comes to both single and multi-threading performance, and therefore overall performance and the ability to run multiple tasks inside of a server, modern consumer CPUs absolutely obliterate used enterprise gear that we're all used to running. The 5500 GT notches a Cinebench R15 multi-threaded score of 2355, putting it just behind CPUs like the Intel Scalable 5218N and the Xeon E52697AV4, both of which have 16 cores and 32 threads. And when it comes to single-threaded performance, it's like a toddler fighting Mike Tyson. In this base configuration, we've got 16 gigabytes of DDR4-3200 unbuffered ECC memory, which I am very happy to see. The system will also support up to 64 gigabytes of unbuffered ECC, which should give us more than enough available for running a file server, as well as virtual machines or container environments. As far as connecting up all the drive bays, the AORS B550i motherboard has four SATA ports on board. ITX motherboards with fast CPUs aren't usually known for their internal connectivity options, especially consumer boards where SATA is quickly becoming a legacy port. And yes, that hurt me just as much to write as it hurt you to listen to. 45 Drives is utilizing a clever little card to connect the other four drive bays with an add-on SATA controller via one of the motherboard's M.2 slots. There's a second slot on the bottom of the motherboard where we've got a one terabyte Kingston NVMe drive for storing the OS of your choosing. As for the M.2 SATA controller, I really like this solution as it leaves the PCI Express X16 slot free for other cards like 10 or 25 gigabit networking or maybe even a GPU for video transcoding. The server itself is fairly compact, but they still managed to leave room to support a single PCI Express slot. And it's not even a low-profile card. You can install a full-height card up to 7.5 inches long. I'm actually planning on running this Intel A310 card from Sparkle, which will give me AV1 and HEVC hardware encoding. The smart money used to be on old NVIDIA Quadro cards for encoding work, but the A310 from Intel has the same QuickSync engine as their high-end GPUs, and it's just $100 brand new. It's a pretty solid deal if you do any video heavy services. Now, I did run into one potential issue with the X16 slot on this particular motherboard. While it does support bifurcation, it will only support dual X8 lanes or a single X8 and two X4s. That means that would be a no-go for cards like this, the quad NVMe adapters that most people like to install in home labs to get high-speed NVMe storage. Just something to keep in mind on this particular board. Lastly, the I.O. options on this motherboard are pretty solid, with 2.5 gigabit networking, as well as a pair of USB 10 gigabit per second ports, one Type-A and one Type-C. There's also 802.11ax Wi-Fi 6 if you wanted to run this as a purely wireless server, which is kind of a nice bonus of running consumer hardware. Now, one of the things I've always loved about 45 drives is their approach to software. Not only are they huge supporters of open source, they truly believe there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all solution. 
While 45 drives themselves ships Rocky Linux with Houston UI and usually relies on Ceph for a lot of their server products, my personal preference is Proxmox for virtualization and TrueNAS for storage. It's great because we can still use what we want and no one has to die in an online forum. Now for this video, I have eight 20 terabyte Seagate Exos drives installed, and I fired up TrueNAS to test everything out. Now, these aren't blank drives either. They actually came out of my Storinator AV15 server, and they have about 60 terabytes of data written to them. The 2.5 gigabit real technique was recognized immediately by TrueNAS without any problems, and I had no trouble maxing out that bandwidth to the tune of around 285 megabytes per second in sequential reads and writes. Obviously, this isn't a very scientific test, but some solid results nonetheless. Now, I'm sure the question you've all been asking yourselves is, okay, but how much is this actually going to cost? As I mentioned, the HL8 is available in three different base configurations. You can buy just the chassis and the backplane, and that'll run you $599. Adding in the Silverstone 500 watt Flex ATX power supply will run you $799. For the full build that you see here, you'll be looking at $1,399, and that includes the Gigabyte B550i Aorus Pro AX motherboard, a Ryzen 6 Core 5500 GT, 16 gigabytes of DDR4-3200 unbuffered ECC, a Kingston 1TB Gen 4x4 NVMe drive, as well as a Noctua NH-L9A cooler. Also, for those who don't need a full 8-bay unit and want something a little bit smaller, they're also selling an HL4. That is basically the exact same specs as you see here, but with four drives instead of eight. That's going to start at $529 for the bare chassis, $699 for the unit including a power supply, and $1199 for the exact same full build that you see here. Now, I know there's going to be two camps of people watching this video. There's going to be those that say, that's way too expensive. I can buy an 8 base server on eBay for $200. And you're not wrong, but I doubt you've also ever priced out brand new server hardware. There's also the second crowd, which knows exactly how much equipment like this costs to manufacture and what competing products run. 45 drives has never been the cheapest option, but neither is Noctua, and I don't see people complaining about a Noctua tax. Looking at a couple comparable offerings from Synology and QNAP, there's the Synology Disk Station DS1821 Plus, an all-plastic, all-in-one NAS solution powered by a first-generation Ryzen embedded quad-core CPU and a whopping 4 gigabytes of DDR4. As I've covered on the channel before, your only option for software is Synology's own NAS solution, as the bootloader on that machine is completely locked down. The 1821 Plus retails for $1099 as of the time of filming. They do have a high-performance model, which is physically identical, but with a faster Ryzen 1708B embedded CPU. It's still only four cores and still based on Zen 1 architecture. It also gets you eight gigabytes of memory instead of just four, and that stellar package can be yours for just $1,799. QNAP has an eight-bay model for the exact same price of the HL8 at $1,399, and theirs even comes with 10 gigabit networking out of the box. Of course, it's also based on an Intel Atom C5125. Now, I will give QNAP some credit here. That's actually one of the newer Atom CPUs built on Parker Ridge architecture with a 10 nanometer FinFET. It has eight cores and eight threads and a 50 watt TDP. A quick Paxmark comparison between the C5125 and the Ryzen 5500 GT from the HL8 shows the Ryzen chip is nearly two and a half times faster, which should come as a surprise to no one. And if you need 10 gigabit networking, there's always the full X16 PCI Express slot available on the HL8. Now, those of you who watch my channel know I don't do sponsored videos very often, but the HL8 is a product that I've wanted to see exist for a very long time. The initial spark to build this came from my presentation last year at 45 Drives, and I had a great deal of input when it came to some of the final design elements and the pricing on this unit. This was absolutely a collaborative effort, and I'm thrilled to have been able to work with 45 Drives to help bring the HL8 to life. It's a powerful and modular server that can fit comfortably on a desk, it won't break the bank, and doesn't require a server rack to operate. If you're watching this video, then the website for the HL8 should be up and running and taking orders. Check it out over at 45homelab.com, or you can follow the links down in the video description. On your way down there, let me know what would you do with a 45 Home Lab HL8? Would you buy the full build with the Ryzen 5500 GT, or would you build your own from scratch? 
I already have a plan of what I'm going to do with mine, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that upcoming build. It's going to have 16 cores of awesome inside, I can guarantee that. If you like this video, make sure to drop me a thumbs up and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Head on over to craftcomputing.store to pick up some of our fantastic glassware and start drinking like a pro. Or you can support me on Patreon and get access to the exclusive Discord server, where you can talk directly with myself as well as the other hosts from Talking Heads. That's going to do it for me in this one. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Beer for today is from Sierra Nevada. It is the cosmic little thing. Uh, this is their hazy double IPA clocking in at 8%. Almost like I planned that number out. So Sierra Nevada's Cosmic Little Thing Hazy Double IPA. They have so many different variants of their Little Something IPA, and they are all fantastic. Um, this one's a little bit interesting. This one, uh, it doesn't appear overly hazy. Like, I've had West Coast IPAs that are, that are cloudier than this. This really imbues some of that West Coast flair that Sierra Nevada is really famous for with some of that New Age hazy, but not so hazy that it burns your throat on the way down style. It's really quite interesting. Think of it like this. It has the forward notes of a West Coast IPA. Think of Sierra Nevada Pale, but turned up to 11. It, it has all of those, those hop, dank, sweaty, uh, vegetal, earthy kind of notes right up front that you would normally get in a hazy in the form of blood orange and pineapple and guava and, and you know, all those nice fruity flavors. This this is like, this is going to sound weird, the wet gym sock of a hazy IPA. <laughs> uh. <laughs> now I'm sure people are lining up to buy it now. <laughs>